Hey y'all, Miss Mayhew here, and we are going to do a little bit of review on membranes for your AP exam. So what we're gonna do is we are going to go through each of the units and we are going to talk about how membranes are involved in each of those units. So unit one, um, our macromolecule unit, this is where we are going to talk about the structure and the function of lipids, which is what membranes are made out of. In unit two, we are going to talk about the functions of membranes in the cell. So both your cell membrane and the membranes of your other organelles. In unit three, we're going to go into even more detail in the membranes of organelles specifically the mitochondria and the chloroplast, and we're going to talk about the importance that mem membranes play in those processes. In unit four, we're going to talk about what the membrane does during cellular division. In unit five, we're going to talk about how the difference in membranes, specifically the nuclear membrane, um, is going to make a difference in the protein synthesis of prokaryotes and eukaryotes. In unit six, we're gonna talk about how membranes have evolved and we're gonna talk about endosymbiosis and some of the evidence that membranes in our endosymbionts support that theory. Now, the most basic thing that you need to understand about um, lipids are the chemical structures. Okay, that includes the elements that it's made up of, which are carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Now, unlike carbohydrates, these don't come in a ratio. They are consisted mostly of carbon and hydrogen with a little bit of oxygen. They're held together by ester bonds, and the monomers are triglycerides. Triglycerides are three fatty acids linked to a glycerol backbone. On top of knowing the structure of lipids, you also need to know how that structure affects the function of the lipids. Now, when we're talking about lipids and those fatty acid chains, those can be classified as either saturated fats or unsaturated fats. Saturated fats are saturated with hydrogens, meaning they have the maximum number of hydrogens bonded to the carbon chain and because of that there are no double bonds all of the carbons are bound to each other and to the hydrogens and there's no double bonds um, because of this they are solid at room temperature they're all evenly spaced the zigzags that you're used to seeing um, can fit pretty easily together and they're going to be solid they're going to stay together um, because of that, um, the fact that they're saturated. Unsaturated fats, on the other hand, have at least one part of the carbon chain that has um, a double bond. Because of that double bond, you are now trading out the hydrogens that were bound to the carbon and replacing them with a double bond between the carbons. Because of this, that gives you a little kink, a little bend in the the tail and that is going to make it more liquid at room temperature because of that extra little bend the lipids can't pack as tightly together and that's why they're liquid at room temperature now the type of lipid that makes up the um the membrane are phospholipids phospholipids have um, an important structure and that is that they're amphipathic that means that they have a polar head and a non-polar tail. They have two parts to them. The head is polar, so it is going to be hydrophilic. The tails are going to be non-polar, and they are going to be hydrophobic. Now, phospholipids that make up the plasma membrane, they do so by forming a, a bilayer. So the heads are going to be on the outside and the tails are going to be oriented on the inside and they're going to create this bilayer around the cell. Now this membrane, this phospholipid membrane, is not static. It is um, what we refer to as the fluid mosaic model, meaning those phospholipids can move around each other 
They can move and slide next to each other. Um, they can move proteins around. Um, and that fluidity is affected by cholesterol and the degree of saturation. Cholesterol is going to maintain the fluidity. That is going to be um, a molecule that's found in the lipid tails because it is nonpolar. And it is going to help maintain the fluidity when it gets too hot and when it gets too cold. So that keeps it from getting too rigid when it's cold and too fluid when it's hot. The saturation is also going to affect membrane fluidity. The, the more saturated fats you have, the more rigid that the membrane is gonna be because um, it's, um, they're, they can pack tightly together. And the unsaturated fats, the more unsaturated you have, that's gonna increase the fluidity because they're not going to be able to pack as well with those extra bends in the tails. Now, unit two is where membranes definitely shine. So the membrane, when we're looking at cells, is the outer portion of the cell, and this is what separates the cell from the extracellular environment. Along with making up the plasma membrane on the outside, it also is used to create compartments within the cell in order to increase efficiency and to separate different spaces within the cell. This is important because organelles have different functions and need to do those functions within a compartment that's their own. Another important concept that membranes play a role in when we're talking about cell biology is the surface area of the cell. Now, the surface area is basically the area of the plasma membrane. That's important because the surface area is what determines how much that cell can interact with its environment, how much material can be transported across the membrane. Um, along with talking about the materials being transported across the membrane, it's important to point out that the cell membrane is selectively permeable. That means that only certain things can pass through the membrane. Those things have to be able to pass through that nonpolar region of the fatty acid tails. So the only things that can cross without any assistance are small nonpolar molecules. All other molecules are going to need some type of channel to transport them across. Now, when these materials pass through a protein channel, they can do so passively or actively. If they pass through the membrane um, along their concentration gradient and it doesn't require any energy, that is a type of facilitated transport. And an example would be aquaporin. That allows water to move along its concentration gradient in the case of osmosis through a protein channel called aquaporin um, and that is an example of facilitated transport. Um, active transport is going to be where you have the protein channel but in order for the molecules to pass through it it needs some type of energy. Now these molecules are going to be moving against their concentration gradient and therefore need energy from ATP to phosphorylate that channel. Now in the energetics unit, the membranes are important because both the mitochondria and the chloroplast, which are the organelles where unit three takes place, are made up of two membranes. So for example, in the mitochondria, you have an inner membrane and an outer membrane. In between the outer membrane and the inner membrane, you have a region called the inner membrane space. Now, this membrane is important because this is what allows a concentration gradient to form. So you end up with lots of hydrogens accumulating in the inner membrane space, which is gonna create this electrochemical gradient um, or a difference in charge between the inner membrane space and the matrix. Now that, um, that difference, that electrochemical gradient, is going to 
drive the movement of those hydrogens back down their concentration gradient through the protein channel ATP synthase where ATP is um, generated. Now, in the inner membrane, we have um, lots of cristae, which are folds in that inner membrane, and that increases surface area. The reason it's important to have an increased surface area is because that inner membrane has the electron transport chain, or all of those protein complexes that allow for the movement of electrons and the pumping of those hydrogens across the membrane. So that membrane is important because this is where that gradient is even built. Like I said, once we have this um, concentration gradient built, we are going to have the hydrogens flowing along their gradient back into the matrix through ATP synthase, where we phosphorylate adenosine diphosphate into adenosine triphosphate through a process called oxidative phosphorylation. Chloroplasts also have a similar structure um, and a similar function. They have two membranes. They have um, a regular um, membrane on the outside and they have a thylakoid membrane, which is the inner membrane. Now, in the thylakoid membrane, we have photosystems that are embedded into that thylakoid membrane that create an electron transport chain. The difference, though, is that if y'all will recall your mega sheet notes, these photosystems are going to use energy from sunlight, from photons, to charge and move the, um, the electrons across. And we're still going to be pumping hydrogens across the membrane in order to create a concentration gradient. Um, this inner membrane that we call the thylakoid membrane is going to separate the lumen and the stroma. The lumen is the inside of the inside, and the stroma is the space in between the outer membrane and the thylakoid membrane. In unit four, we talked about how the cell divides and the role that the membranes play in cell division is really in that last step. In cytokinesis, this is where we actually separate the cytoplasm of the cells. Now, this looks a little differently in animals and in plants. In animals, all we have is the plasma membrane. So, when the cell is ready to divide, a cleavage furrow is going to form and it's going to pinch the two cells or the cell into two and it's going to um, shrink that that ring um, through a protein called actin that is going to shrink and shrink and shrink until it finally splits the cytoplasm in half and your plasma membrane is formed around both of your new cells. In plants, we can't do this because um, the, the cell wall is too rigid. So we have these special organelles that are going to build a membrane down the middle um, along this cell plate with cellulose. It's going to form the new cell walls so that eventually you end up with a new cell wall and a new plasma membrane for both of your new cells. In unit five, the real important role that membranes play is mostly in the difference between prokaryotic and eukaryotic protein synthesis. In eukaryotes, remember, you have a nuclear membrane around your nucleus. So, Transcription is going to happen within the nucleus. Then the RNA has to be processed and travel out of the nucleus to the ribosome in order to be translated. But in prokaryotes, there's no nuclear membrane. Their transcription and translation can happen at the same exact time. Now, there are proteins that are um, bound for the membrane, 
or um, that are going to be translated on the rough endoplasmic reticulum. The direction that these go is from the nucleus, the transcription, then they travel through the rough endoplasmic reticulum, then they travel through the Golgi, then to the membrane, or um, completely out of the cell, depending on what that protein actually is and what its function is. When we talk membranes in evolution, we're going to be looking primarily at the evolutionary advantage of carb compartmentalization in cells. This is an advantage because now you can keep certain cellular processes separate from the cytoplasm or from other organelles or other cellular processes. Endosymbiosis is another um, important part of evolution because the membranes are being used as evidence to support this evolution that occurred through endosymbiosis. The evidence is consisting um, or in relation to membranes. There's more evidence than just these two points. But one is that the outer membrane of the endosymbiont is similar to the host membrane, kind of like what you would see through endocytosis when a cell engulfs something and it forms a vesicle around the thing that was engulfed. The inner membrane, though, is not from the host cell, but from the original membrane of the original organism itself. Now, just remember that as you're going through each of these different units and you're thinking about membranes and you're studying for the AP exam, remember that there are tons of examples and specific scenarios that they can bring up. You need to understand how to apply these concepts to the different specific scenarios they give you on the AP exam. If you have any questions while you're studying, make sure to email your teacher, um, but good luck.